Next we have Dr. Rupa Kanthi Viswas, retinal detachment with subretinal blood management. So uh, uh, initially uh, my topic was subretinal blood removal, that's what Anirudh has given to me. But uh, I mean to be very precise, the subretinal blood, let me before going to that, subretinal blood can be of a maybe just a dot hemorrhage to a one disc diameter or two disc diameter size to an extensive you know, total retinal detachment uh, of that. So the other part which can be medically managed like either giving uh, a cocktail regime of anti-VEGF and subretinal, I mean, I mean uh, the intravitreal TPA along with uh, uh, intravitreal gas. So that part I'm leaving it apart. So we will just deal with those who needs actually the surgical intervention to remove the subretinal blood. So uh, this is a 70 year old gentleman who had a, the other eye was absolutely fine but this eye had a extensive hemorrhage which is you know uh, having there is no view and it's uh, the whole eye is totally completely filled with blood so here when you start the blood i think most of them those who have done with dealt with this breakthrough bleed the easiest part is doing the vitrectomy because once the blood has come into this, the, the fibrinolytic material, they actually lysis, causes lysis of the vitreous fibri, uh, fiber strands. And the PVD is most of the time is there. The vitrectomy becomes visualization of the blood is, uh, I mean, the vitreous is very good because of the blood staining. So that is the most easy, easiest part. So as, as you know, uh, sorry, I could not dim this light, but this is, this is, after editing, it has become a little more dim. So uh, once you finish it, then I, uh, you know, try to inject uh, TPA multiple uh, into the subretinal space in multiple quadrants. The reason is that if you, uh, if it is as like this kind of an extensive hemorrhage, and if you inject in one area, it is very difficult to, you know, percolate to the other area. So it is, it is not a good, it is, it's a good idea to inject, uh, you know, small, small amount into the multiple places. But again, you should not go to that, you know, maximum tolerable limit. So there is also for that. And then you, you wait for another, uh, you know, typically they tell it uh, 20 minutes. It depends upon how my list is there. So I around 10 minutes also after then I start doing uh, uh, retinotomy. So but before doing retinotomy, you have to give this injection. Otherwise, this TPA will come out. So there is no, uh, you know, uh, point of giving this. So. I have done the cauterization in the periphery. This takes a little longer time, but this is worth of using the scissor and cut the retina precisely so that you know when once you are you know putting it back, it comes much easier. Instead of using a cutter, if you use cutter, there is always a tissue cut. Here you are actually incising the tissue and they are cutting the tissue. So there is a tissue gap is going to be there if you use cutter rather than you just use it and this is much more controlled way you give a multiple snap and then finish it off the chance of choroidal touch is also not here because you have selected temporal part which has the you know some amount of significant amount of the blood there so you just once the initial cut is there then you know you ref, uh, ref, uh, put the flap back and yeah this, this is the most important part which i got caught here is the RPE, so retinal pigment epithelium along with the blood, the pigment epithelium which is lying under this is uh, uh, very difficult. I'll just uh, stop it here for a second. So here the most important part is that you are dealing with a uh, liquid blood, you are dealing with a clot and you are dealing with, uh, you know, uh, RPE and in the other side the flap is there. So there are multiple, you need to understand here the fluidics of that. So your, you know, fluid should come into in such a way so that the flap does not go much more flattering and your flu first it is good idea either with the cutter or with your uh, flute needle it take out the, you know, uh, liquid blood first and then handle the clot and during the handling the clot the most difficult part is handling RPE retinal pigment epithelium at this because this is at completely adherent at that area. So my suggestion is that if you are leaving some amount of the uh, clot in the peripheral area, you can leave it, but try to preserve as much as RP as possible. So I'll show you at the end how, how it has landed up. So, oh, sorry. Oh. So once you finish it off, all the blood you remove completely this is this is 
yeah this is the there's the rp and there's a clot what you are taking care of it slowly otherwise you another option is that you just take it in front of the retina and then slowly chew it up or you can use as a foreign body and then sometimes it is it is so fibrous that it is difficult to take out and then you put the flap back and pfcl the rest of the part is very routine procedure so put the flap back endo laser under silicon oil, under pfcl you do endo laser and then direct silicon oil exchange so this is this is the post operative after 7 days so you can see that extensive here even with the utmost precaution also i could not save the extensive part but i was very lucky to preserve the subfoveal area of rpe so the patient had a, tempo, a nasal scotoma but still the patient had a significant good amount of the vision because of the subfoveal rpe is preserved this is the other eye picture and this is the oct at the end of the surgery after 6 uh, weeks so uh, this is just to open for the discussion and i invite all of you for aioc 2024 to kolkata and please come and you know stay with us in the city of joy no uh, really is yet to come up yet to come up first week of uh, june we june. don't know the exact dates uh Uh, Dr. Rupak, like in the last case, uh, is there an option of the coronal patch? Because as you said, that that area was diseased. Uh, see again, this is a coronal patch because once the blood is a uh, subretinal blood is there, and the other part of the RP is not that white vitalized. So it is try to preserve the RP during surgery. It is much more easier rather than taking a coronal graft or the RP graft from the other area. because in that situation again you need to go to the you need to preserve it you are dealing in the temporal part so again you need to go to the nasal part to you know harvest that rpe so you need to cut the retina again to the you know extend the uh, you know your retina retinotomy uh, site to the nasal area and then harvest uh, rpe from there yes it is possible but again it is much easier you know to take care of the rp so if you keep it in your mind that yes rp should i should not chew up the rp along with once you are taking up the you know clot especially so this this is this is most important so i i will come to a very basic questions when do you plan and subretinal tpa to with the gas to dislodge a subretinal hemorrhage and when do you plan this extensive operation because nowadays with the subretinal tpa and the tampon and the results are quite pretty well pretty good actually that's what in, in the initial phase uh, i mean before starting the talk only i was just describing so up to 2 to 3 days diameter of uh, 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 blood and the if we can measure the amount of the blood is up to i think sir can guide us up to i think the thickness of the blood is also important yeah thickness of the blood so up to if we can measure up to around Thousand, 150 to 200 of micron size so grossly is up to the retinal or maximum up to the retinal thickness of the blood so and diameter wise around 2 to 3 d diameter this amount of the blood can be tolerated but yes uh, i mean not tolerated this can be handled medically kind of or a conservative way uh, and uh, probably if it is in the subfoveal area so we i will definitely prefer for doing uh, gas tamponade along with that and if it is in the away from the fovea so probably just uh, anti vagab injection and further investigation accordingly inject the tpa using a special medovan can no this is normal one tpa you you it comes in uh, in a vial uh -huh. so uh, you inject 19 ml of uh, you know uh, water for injection okay. and then dilute it and from there you take i mean you need to use it of 0.5 points uh, yeah maximum 0.5 so if you go to the multiple places the dose is 10 to 50 microns yeah 10 to micron. 50 micron in total in total Okay, so how do you uh, inject only that? That much is amount? that is with with it one ml syringe oh. and forty one, forty forty one gauge or thirty eight gauge cannula. Okay. Thank you, sir. Your experience? I don't think I would have done anything different. What? But yes, uh, even TPA nowadays, what you have enough evidence, you do not need TPA. So whether it is just gas bubble versus TPA and gas bubble, I think more or less results are. good the the why smaller bubble because that is for uh, conservative way you are talking about for conservative management conservative uh, management uh, uh. yeah but because and for that what you are talking about is 
when you put a gas bubble you need to have enough space around that bubble that uh, clot should get pushed and that is what logic why you look at a smaller clot but like what you have here there is no place nothing moves around because there is so much of blood here so, so unless you go physically remove it but again all these cases already contracted blood most of the RP is already gone choroid also sometimes become just leathery yeah I mean I would say uh, congratulations and that you got a lucky uh, good results and what we again look at it these eyes with this blood some amount of blood is always left so much of manipulation subretinal they come back with a subretinal proliferation more than a preretinal proliferation so recurrence is very high so we can do as clean job as possible that's best you can do and hope for our best is there a role of a pre-treatment like we do in some diabetic vitrectomies you give anti veg of three or four days prior so similarly is there a role of giving rtpa one day prior to doing this kind of a surgery just to make sure that the blood is lysed and removal will be actually easy? that is uh, by the two stage uh, treatment actually that works like you give anti like a tpa maybe let the patient be supine previous 24 hours later or something most of the time 10 minutes waiting does not work because I have huge clot, small things. So ideal time should be 45 minutes. But you inject and wait 45 minutes practically may not be possible. Also, that used to like put put the clot, uh, inject, wait, get something done, and come back again. And most of the cases when you are doing under local anesthesia, again is is not practical. So easier way, what you are saying is probably now best way. Inject previous day apparently is as good as uh, and you don't have to go in the subretinal space. With this cavity, you inject and take for an exit. And in fact, you know, planning for this is very important. What actually we have learned from Sir, uh, all the cases Sir used to when we are doing our fellowship, I'm just sharing, uh, you know, our fellowship days. Sir used to ask us ki whenever you, you uh, go start for the surgery, what is your plan? So this is very important. I think especially you cannot have the ad hoc plan key if this is, yes, you can have the plan B in your, in your mind, but in, you have to have the plan A. You cannot decide, go and decide on table, whatever I'll see. So that's what the initial ultrasonography by yourself is one of the, or somebody whom you can definitely rely upon. That ultrasonography is important here because how much liquefaction of blood is there, where exactly the PVD is completely is there or not and the retinal detachment surgery associated with any other suprachoroidal hemorrhage also because yes this pcv can bleed can lead to a some amount of the suprachoroidal blood sometime so these are the important issues which you need to know earlier but again anti i don't think that having any role uh, in this kind of situation because again that is a waste because uh, anti you are not going to uh, you know work there for at least for a month time so by doing vitrectomy again it will get washed out so maybe at the end you can put but again under the silicon oil there is a matter of doubt i think we give anti vegev when we are planning for this intravitreal tpa anti vegev injection as well as gas we are not planning for a subretinal surgery or rather we are yes, not planning for, for a vitrectomy yeah just one more point uh, like uh, how dr himadri was asking so one point is that another is to deal with anterior uh, in front of the retina other uh, way of dealing it is the cocktail in the subretinal space. So there you can give some um, TPA, anti vegif and some and uh, yes. small bubble of air. So but here you need to remember that ask the patient not to be in the supine position in this. Most of the time sitting <coughs> position so that sitting or maybe in, in some lateral position. Otherwise, the bubble can come up to the fovea and causes the rupture of the fovea and you can land up of having a macro hole. There are multiple examples are there. So especially when you, when the PVD is still attached in the phobia area, so that you can land up of having it.